Boas tardes. Sou Steven Levitsky, diretor de Dr. Plus. É um prazer ter conosco a deputada federal brasileira Talíria Petroni. Hoje é um prazer ter Ms. Talíria Petroni aqui, uma brasileira de congresswoman. Eu não falo português bem, então eu vou falar em inglês. Olá, todos. Welcome to this to today's webinar, Democratic Resilience Against Political Violence, a conversation with Congresswoman Talidia Petroni. This event is being done in collaboration with Aladi, the Afro-Latin American Research Institute at Harvard. I also want to thank the United States Network for Democracy in Brazil, and especially my esteemed colleague, uh, Sidney Chaloub, for making this event happen. Uh, it is extraordinarily difficult to build and sustain a democracy in a context of extreme social and racial inequality. It took my, my country, the United States, 180 years to achieve democracy. And the last steps of that democratization made possible by the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s triggered the extremist reaction and polarization that now threatens our democracy. So the road to multiracial democracy is a long, and difficult one. As we've seen both in the United States and Brazil, it is full of obstacles, it is full of setbacks. And crucially, it is a struggle that has to be waged every single day. So when we get the chance to listen to someone who is engaged in that daily struggle, year after year, we left at that opportunity. This year, Dr. Klass uh, has made the defense of democracy and the struggle for racial equality two of our three major themes. Brazil, of course, is front and center in both of those areas. Brazil's recent steps towards multiracial democracy are now in peril. Many of the achievements of the, of the late 20th and early 21st century are now under threat. Some of them are being rolled back. Basic rights are being threatened and crucially, lives are being lost. The rollback of democratic rights doesn't always get the attention that it deserves, often because the first victims of that rollback are often its most vulnerable citizens, people without connections or friends in powerful places, racial minorities, women, sexual minorities. So we at Dr. Class believe it is critical, critical to focus public attention on the assault on human civil democratic rights in Brazil and elsewhere, as well as the grassroots efforts to defend those rights. In that context, it is both a great pleasure and an honor to welcome and introduce Congresswoman Talidia Petroni. Congresswoman Petroni is by profession a history teacher who found inspiration for political activism in the classroom. In 2016, she was elected to the city council in the city of Niteroi in the state of uh, Rio de Janeiro, winning more votes than any other candidate. Two years later, she was elected to Brazil's federal Congress on the ticket of the Socialism and Liberty Party, PSOL. Her entry into politics more or less corresponded with an extreme right-wing reaction that not only brought Jair Bolsonaro to the presidency, but also unleashed a wave of violence against progressive and minority rights activists on a whole range of fronts. Ms. Petrone has uh, suffered death threats ever since she was elected to city council, but those death threats intensified after Bolsonaro's election in 2018. We have asked Congresswoman Petrone to talk about her experience in politics, to talk about how extremist violence is challenging Brazilian democracy, and to talk about how she and many others are fighting back. Uh, a few very quick housekeeping notes before we begin. First of all, the event will take place in both English and Portuguese. Simultaneous translation is being offered in both languages. So if you need translation, please click on the language button at the bottom of your screen and select the, the language that you prefer. Secondly, we will be recording today's webinar and it will be available on the Dr. The Dr. Class YouTube channel shortly after the session today. Uh, and third, we hope that we will see you at other lectures and other events that we host here at Dr. Class. So in the chat, we've added links to our online calendar as well as our social media channel. Um, finally, we'd love to hear from you during the presentation today. The chat function is disabled, so you're muted. The chat function is disabled, so it doesn't, it doesn't look like we want to hear from you, but we do. Um, if, if you have a question at any point for Congresswoman Petrone, please feel free to send your question through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Congresswoman Petrone will talk for about 30 minutes, after which we'll take questions from the audience 
you should feel free to submit questions at any point during the talk. Um, so without any further ado, I am honored to hand the microphone over to Congresswoman Talidia Petron. Olá, gente. Hello, everyone. Good evening, if you are in Brazil, because it is the beginning of the evening here. I will try to speak slowly. I usually speak faster, but I will try to speak slowly for us to reflect upon a few things. And I want us to be able to interact when it comes to such an important topic. First and foremost, I would like to thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm extremely happy to be here. I am an activist and I am a lawmaker right now, but I see myself as a teacher and an activist and a human rights fighter. So before coming into office, which is now where I fight, I was already an activist. And at this moment in time, I get more and more confirmation of why this kind of conversation is so important. We have to keep on fighting to fight the extreme right. We need political resistance. It is impossible to go through this kind of dark time we're going through without solidarity between countries. It is paramount for us to have international solidarity. Extreme right-wing parties are not going to be defeated by a single country. We need to think about the rights of females and indigenous people and workers all over the world. And we will only be able to get these rights together, not as separate countries. So let me start off with some food for thought. The world is going through an unprecedented sanitation crisis right now. And I think this goes to show that we have a crisis in civilization. This sanitation crisis may be the biggest that these generations have gone through. In Brazil, we have 245,000 people who have died because of COVID-19. I think this number amounts to 2 million people all over the world. They have become victim, victims of this strategy. And this is a sanitation crisis that is also related to society and the environment and the economy. We have 14 million people who are unemployed here. Over 40% of Brazilian workers are not formally hired by their employ, employers. They need to make it happen to make ends meet and to have food on the table. And we are talking about a huge country with a lot of regional inequality. And this is extremely serious. And unfortunately, I think that this scenario has been brought about by a convergence of different crises. And unfortunately, the Brazilian government has been facing this situation with authoritarianism, fundamentalism, and an unbelievable denialism, which is against science. Unfortunately, right now in Brazilian democracy, we are taking large strides backwards. And think about the bodies that are left behind because of this civilization crisis and because of this unacceptable reaction by the Brazilian government. The victims are black bodies. They are female bodies. They are bodies from underprivileged communities. And when I say that we are taking large strides backwards in democracy, it is also important to acknowledge that actually 
democracy has never come into full fruition in Brazil. Our democratic institutions are fragile, our democracy is incomplete, and it has never truly reached the outskirts of cities and the Brazilian favelas. And it is impossible to think about how we got here without talking about the creation of Brazil as a state. We had centuries of colonization. And unfortunately, colonialism was not ended when we had our late independence cry. We are still slave-based, patriarchal, fundamentalist, based on white supremacy, based on power, based on heteronormative logics, based on the power in the hands of landowners, etc., etc. In this Brazil, this country of power is not the country of minorities because minorities didn't own power. This is the country that existed before the country that exists now, and it was the foundation for it. So unfortunately, colonialism is still here. Of course, here we are holding a conversation between countries that sometimes are intertwined. However, we are located in very different places and we have very different histories when it comes to international power. And it is extremely important for us to develop new relationships between countries. This colonialism that we still have here also needs to be faced in the relationship we have between countries nowadays. So colonialism brought us here and it was used as a foundation for what we have right now. So it is important for us to remember and to be aware of the fact that political violence has been the foundation of the Brazilian state. Think about it. Before being colonized by the Portuguese, we had at least 3 million indigenous people here who were the victims of ethnicide and genocide. Right now, we have a little bit over 800,000 indigenous people, but we have 210 million people in Brazil. So it's under 0.05% of the population. This makes us realize that violence has been in our history and it's been the foundation of it. We need to remember that Brazil is the country that received the most slave, enslaved people during the African diaspora. I think it is 5 million plus people but these are official numbers. It was way more than that. People who were enslaved in Africa and brought over here, who were put in boats, who were roped, who were stolen, and who were brought over here. They were called load or cargo. And when they were useless or when they got sick, they would just be thrown into the sea. They would be disposed of. The cargo was disposed of during colonialism while we officially had slavery in Brazil. But these bodies, these people who were called cargo and who were violated are the same bodies that right now are also violated and are also disposed of and are the victims of the violence of the state. É um minuto que aconteceu alguma coisa com a tradução. Não, sem problema. There was a problem with the translation, I think. É... Será que já melhorou? Is it better now? Para mim estava aparecendo o áudio, o meu próprio áudio em inglês. For me was uh, I was just listening to myself. I think that é... That problem was solved. So I was saying 
this logic based in slavery is at the foundation of our country, at the base of the Brazilian state. Unfortunately, it's not just that uh, we have lived in different dictatorships, but in the last one in 1964, legalized the, the genocide and torture as a uh, way to operate uh, and created a policy that, that is deadly. We had uh, militars that understood that it was legitimate just uh, to put uh, rats uh, in the vaginas of women. I'm going to repeat this, uh, to insert rats uh, in the vaginas of women as a way of torture. Unfortunately, we have a president that, ha that reminded us of uh, all these uh, horrible figures uh, at the plenary in the Congress and uh, she exhausted the Ustra that was a dictator that, that tortured uh, President Dilma that was victim of a coup d'etat. In line with uh, our Brazilian history, Marcelo, that is also my advisor and is controlling the time, just let me know what I'm getting to the time limit. When we were living in the Brazilian dictatorship, uh, we had uh, over 600 people that, that are still missing and 8,000 indigenous people were killed uh, to create uh, dams and roads, opening paths uh, to destroy the Amazon, the Cerrado in Brazil and to perpetrate uh, an economy that lags behind uh, based uh, on uh, uh, mining and causes a tremendous uh, effect uh, in the, the environment. And that's very important to remember today. And also the, these uh, environmental collapse stimulated by the Brazilian government uh, and anyone that reacts to that, it, it also becomes a victim of the state. Unfortunately, Brazil was uh, created in the hand of slaves uh, and on the basis uh, of African and indigenous blood. I think that's a difference uh, in our countries. Um, there are some people that insist in saying that uh, in the constitution of the Brazilian state, uh, there was a mixture and miscegenation of races, but we still live in this myth uh, of racial democracy. But when we look at this history and see how this uh, history becomes uh, present in the data we have, we cannot deny that uh, there's still racism in Brazil, that inequality in Brazil is explicit, uh, not only in terms uh, of rich people and poor people, those that uh, hold the power, those that hold the lands uh, are white people. Those that are poor and uh, those that are suffer the most uh, the COVID-19, those that, that struggle the most to get uh, food are black, as it's been all throughout our history. And uh, when, so I insist that this colonialism is evident and today, because Brazil, we live in a Parkerty is the fifth country with the highest number of feminicides in the world that mainly kills black women. It's the country where trans are killed the most, is where we still experience corrective rape. It's a, a, a country where bisexual love is not accepted. Uh, we are speaking about the 21st century and uh, when the, this uh, slavery base is expressed in racism that's non-stop uh, 
So every 23 minutes, uh, a black youth is killed in Brazil. We have the third population imprisoned in the world. Most of them are black. 40% of imprisoned people hasn't even been trialed. And most of them, they're just uh, imprisoned uh, for small crimes. Uh, this uh, supposed uh, war to drugs uh, or kills uh, black youth uh, or imprisons black youth. Unfortunately, mortality, mother's mortality is also black. The religious fundamentalism is also at the basis of our history and also is the base uh, of the political violence uh, we suffer. There is a persecution uh, of uh, Brazilian religions uh, with the, the closure of many of their attempts, uh, their attempts to withdraw the debate uh, of uh, gender discussions in Brazil. I would like to address specifically in the topic uh, of political violence is the country where are those that defend uh, justice are killed the most. Those that uh, fight for the right to land, uh, as the case uh, of the Nandorothy, and also this uh, political violence uh, attack our bodies as black women. And it's related to our history that directly connects uh, to our present moment. There's been uh, three years of the Marielis Franco assassination, and Marielis' ref history reflects uh, the pain that's part of the Brazilian history and also the resistance in Brazil. She was uh, a city representative elective in Rio. She was a socialist, a mother, a black woman, a lesbian, a de fierce defender of human rights, and she was assassinated. Three years uh, have gone, and we still don't know who ordered her assassination. And uh, we still see exiles of important activists, uh, uh, for instance, case of Illis that she defended, uh, as Deborah Diniz, that, that defended the right of women. And she was expelled to the country because she just, it was unbearable for her to live in the conditions of uh, political violence we are living in this moment. And uh, this situation has been exalted by the government of Jair Bolsonaro, coming from the extreme right wing that resulted from a process uh, that started uh, some time ago, the coup d'etat that uh, imprisoned uh, illegally President Lula and uh, that uh, caused the assassination of Mariela and uh, the exile of important activists. And that composed a uh, uh, reality of an incomplete democracy that uh, more and more is being fractured. In Brazil, we have a judicial power, and that's why I refer to the violence of a state, because they committed uh, some acts uh, that uh, disrespected uh, constitution and democratic guarantees uh, under an authoritarian, authoritarian narrative in the country. The judiciary the system is the one that imprisons black people just uh, by the color of their skin. Of somebody say, oh, it was uh, a black thing person that stole and robbed my person. So how many tall thing black people are in Brazil and they are sent to prison just because they are black or thin or tall? And uh, 
that makes a difference of whether a person may survive or not. And that puts us, uh, the activists, uh, in jeopardy. With Bolsonaro, we don't have a systematic attack to, to the left wing, to indigenous people, to Quilombolas people, to, but also we leave the disrespect uh, of uh, civil rights that are have been conquered uh, with long years of uh, struggles. But uh, hatred is also legitimated by the state. Uh, the militia, for instance, and we can touch on that further in a second moment, uh, the explicit racism, the neo fascist groups and white supremacists uh, that uh, portray crimes every day. I cannot see any hope in all that, but somehow they are the response of a resistance and uh, the progress that uh, the violent sectors are conquering. As the black population, for the fact uh, of uh, rebelling to this uh, violence, we have been attacked. Since the very beginning of my public life, I have faced a lot of challenges. Uh, as um, symbolic violence, uh, as being forbidden to get into Congress. Uh, even I had the identification of being a Congresswoman uh, as uh, being subject to offenses uh, in the social media, as being called uh, as um, being a whore that I'm going to be the next one after Marielle, and even concrete threats uh, as, as someone that a man that called me insistently saying that it was going to throw a bomb. So today, my experience as a congresswoman, I'm a federal congresswoman and elected by the, in the state of uh, Rio de Janeiro with over 700,000 votes. And in this state that elected me, I am forbidden to go. I am forbidden to live in the state given the, the violent uh, politics and the threats by uh, militant groups that uh, might uh, execute me. So I ask myself, uh, so why Marielle was assassinated? Uh, why I'm being threatened? So, and that uh, also a threat uh, to our democracy. I, as an experience uh, as a black woman, a mother that uh, was forced uh, to leave the state uh, where I live in because uh, my life uh, was a take uh, and uh, during my maternity leave, for instance, I have a daughter that is uh, three months old and uh, this is part of a problem that reflects uh, the violent structure of the state we live in. So this is not something that is affecting only me. This needs to be faced structurally because it has to do with the fragmented structure of the Brazilian democracy. I can no longer ride a bike to my work as I did when I was a councilwoman in Niterói and I have to use a shooted car, a bulletproof car. I can't go to the corner shop. I can't go back to my state. And this is a problem in our structure. We see that political violence is growing more and more in Brazil. From 2016 to 2020, we had around 330 cases of police brutality in Brazil, one every four days. 
Most of them happened after 2018, when Bolsonaro was growing more popular as a candidate to the presidency. One of his bases was to encourage attacks against black people and females and left-wing activists. When the president feels entitled to have hate speech, he is also entitling the population to promote this hate speech and to be violent and to be aggressive. And more and more, we see that guns become more allowed in Brazil. And this is not today's topic, but this is a very important topic as well. By the way, 60% of political crimes in Brazil are not solved. As we've said before, in 2018, Marielle was assassinated. And two years later, we still don't have a lot of information about it. We see close ties between the people who assassinated Marielle, Bolsonaro and his family. We see the sons of the president in parliamentary teams. We see Bolsonaro and his sons paying tribute to militia leaders. And we see leaders in direct contact with the people who assassinated her. It is unacceptable to see what we have in our democratic state right now. I still have a few minutes left. And I was just taking my time to talk about the tragedy we're going through in Brazil. That's why I didn't talk about resistance yet. But I think we have resistance and we have hope. And it's not childish, naive hope without acknowledging what is going on in the world. But this is black hope, popular hope. And we see this hope growing in Brazil and in the world because more and more we see an anti-racist movement gaining strength. For example, we see the Black Coalition for Rights. And in Brazil, they organize over 150 Black movement organizations. This is the part of an agency in this new generation of anti-racist struggles, working against the genocide of the Black youth and working for political leadership in the Black community. For example, we see Black people going to jail through facial recognition, and we see Black females who are in Congress being unable to take their offices, the, the offices they were chosen and elected for. The assassination of Marielle brought us so much pain, not only because she was my sister and my friend in this struggle, but because she was a Congresswoman she left a gap in Brazilian democracy, but she has brought thousands of black females to this struggle. We are the seeds of Marielle and the feminist movement is growing and it is not any feminism. It is a black feminism, a popular feminism, an anti-capitalism feminism. We also saw something else grow. The left wing that is growing has trans women, lesbian women, women who have been elected as congresswomen and congresswomen fourfold in comparison to 2016, if we think about 2020. And in the country that kills the most trans women, this is also resistance. We see that somehow something is changing. And change can be painful because we are working with the structures of the Brazilian elite that has been in power since forever. And this elite is afraid of losing its power. And because of this fear, this elite is doing what they've always known to do. They are threatening us, they are being violent, and they are trying to stop our bodies from being in politics. They are trying to mute us. And that is why we need an international commitment to put pressure on the Brazilian state and to allow for the existence 
of our political presence so that our bodies are still in this fight against historical inequality. We can no longer accept other Muriels in Brazil. We cannot accept the interruption of the presence of other Muriels. Muriel would always ask, how many more will have to die for this war to end? And now we must ask ourselves, how many more Marielles will have to die before we see the end of this war? How many women who are lesbians, who are from favelas, who are congresswomen and who are black? Unfortunately, we still have to ask ourselves these questions, but we are going to keep on fighting until everyone is free. There's no real freedom without everyone being free. Thank you very much for having me, and I apologize for going a little bit over my time. I'm looking forward to the questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. You didn't go over at all. It was perfect. One question. Do you prefer questions one at a time or a group of questions? Maybe as a group of questions, because maybe we'll be able to answer more questions this way, but it's up to you. Okay. I'm gonna cluster three questions. I'm gonna cluster three questions and uh, then after the answer I'll I'll come back for more. These three questions are actually nicely related and they all come from the audience. Uh, the first one asks Talidia to comment on the role of the media and not just global in promoting a narrative that blames the PT for Brazil's crisis while ignoring the previous 500 years of oppression of much of the population. That's the first question. Second question, um, comes at from a different angle and says that the description of this event neglected to criticize the left for having uh, missed the opportunity to really embrace and promote the rights of black and feminist and LGBTQ plus communities. So the question is uh, to ask you some of the main errors of the PT government and what the left can do to correct itself in the future. The third question, bringing the two together, is how is it possible to unify political forces on the left to confront the extreme right? And I wanna to add to that what you think about alliance, possible alliances with the liberal center. Só isso tudo, né? Wow. Is that all? That's a lot. É, a lot of questions. Okay, so let's get to it. If I forget to address anything, just let me know and just help me out. I was trying to make some notes. So let's talk about the media and the narrative that was build, built blaming the Workers' Party for what we're going through right now. I actually believe that what was built over this time was systematic attacks against the left-wing parties. And this was expressed through an anti-workers party movement. I am from another party. I am not from the workers party and I can definitely criticize them and I will get to it, but I find it unacceptable that we fail to see this process that was covered by the media and used by authoritarianism because they promoted an attack against the workers party which was also an attack against left-wing parties not because of the mistakes that this party made and they did make a few mistakes while being in power but in my opinion the corporations that are in charge of communications in Brazil right now, and I think we have five big networks with the biggest communication channels in Brazil, 
they are related to money. They are related to capital. They are related to the elite. So if we were to criticize the period that the Workers' Party spent in power in Brazil, we also have to admit that we had progress. We are the size of a continent in Brazil. And in some places where people had no power, electrical power, they started having electricity during the Workers' Party administrations. We had social quotas and racial quotas for universities, which led to an increase of Black presence in universities and colleges. And this took power from the elites. We must acknowledge that they stood up against the elite during their administrations. And it is only natural for people to feel threatened by that. Domestic workers had no rights before. And domestic workers are the perfect example of slavery in Brazil. And they started having rights to you know, additional payments every year and to vacation. And they started taking planes to go visit their families. We need to understand that the anti-workers' party narrative was created because of the things the Workers' Party got right, not because of the things they got wrong. And I think this has everything to do with the authoritarianism we see in Brazil right now. Of course, it is a lot more complex than that, but I'm trying to talk about one aspect of this question. But we surely have to be extremely clear when criticizing the gaps that they left behind, that the Workers' party left behind. The conciliation that they had with capital made it harder for us to make more progress. But let me talk about two things that are important. We made progress in something that has a lot to do with the Black people and with the racial conversation we're having here. But we didn't have any progress in land reforms. We didn't have any progress in land reformations in Brazil. We didn't make sure we had rights to land, especially for people who are the victims of being thrown out of indigenous lands, as I was saying at the beginning. We didn't make progress in creating a social safety model, which is extremely violent at the moment. For example, during this period, we saw the military in favelas in Rio de Janeiro. We saw the army going into favelas, which reinforces this idea that black bodies are to die. So it is very important for us to talk about the mistakes that they made because they are not small and they have to do with structural problems. And I think this has to do with the question regarding the alliance in the left-wing parties. I think that it's impossible to face the extreme right with only one party. It's impossible. And we need to be generous and we need solidarity between left-wing parties in Brazil and in the world to face the extreme right. We need an anti-Bolsonaro project that is popular. We won't be able to face Bolsonaro with a project that is presented by what we call the liberal right. And I would like to talk about my experience in Congress. Where we speak a lot about democracy, but when they needed uh, to get into an alliance with Bolsonaro, uh, just uh, to put an end uh, to the retirement uh, program in Brazil, they did so. The same, likewise, even in court, they increased. Uh, 
the different penalties in the that agenda we see the right wing the, that becomes an ally of the authoritarianism so if we need to, to enact some actions uh, to confront fascism and the extreme right wing we still cannot consider that will be a way out to Bolsonarism. The left wing needs to present a project, a popular project, a project that, that, that that's not uh, support the privatizations, uh, that uh, that's not uh, surrenders uh, of the civil rights. Uh, so what we can do at, with uh, the left wings is to propose uh, a progressive program for Brazil. And uh, lastly, about the need for the criticism to the left wing when we speak about uh, the debate uh, on race and gender. I think that unfortunately, many times in Brazil, we have uh, treated uh, the working class as something that is uh, ethereal, that is in the arc, it seems that is in Europe in the 19th century, but at the working class in Brazil, it has color, it has a gender, and it lives in a specific place. And that's where we suffer the violence of the state, that we suffer unemployment, that where we do not have pension programs with no rights, and also with more authoritarianism, Bolsonaro is concentrated, and it is not possible to see, to speak about the confrontation of inequalities of class without understanding that uh, we need to understand the connections between gender, class, and race that uh, go across all the structures in Brazil. And that was another mistake of the left wing in Brazil when the, they minimize, minimized um, a structure and racism in Brazil. So I understand that um, uh, the, pro the proposal of the left wing should uh, consider the aspects of uh, race and gender. So I don't know if I have answered uh, your questions, but I'm still here just to answer more questions or elaborate on these it, aspects. You did, that was pretty impressive. Um, but now I've got an even harder test for you because I'm gonna give you three questions that are totally unrelated, not integrated. Here they go. First question is from Caitlin, two parts. Um, first, how does speak violence in Brazil of the kind that you have been describing relate to other forms of violence, like violence against women, and the violence perpetuated by uh, criminal organizations, the private violence. And secondly, what lessons can be learned from previous periods of resistance uh, in Brazil that can help us with today's violence? So that's the first question. Second is from Sidney Chaluba, who asks how threatened you think affirmative action policies are today in Brazil and how do you see the future of affirmative action in, in Brazil? And the third question, very different, is what, if anything, can the Brazilian left learn from recent developments in the United States, uh, including the extraordinary success of the Black Lives Matter movement and more recently, the defeat of Donald Trump in 2020? Any lessons that can be applied to 2022? Can I start? About the first questions 
Ms. If I understood well, is the relationship between the, the state violence and political violence with the other kinds of violence, as the violence against women, for example. When we think about what are the bodies that are victims of violence in Brazil, they are especially those the, that fight against an elite that has been in power for centuries, taking out the power from the, the working class, from the black people. As in the case of Marielle, Marielle was a woman in Brazil with these characteristics in Brazil, where the participation of uh, women in politics is uh, minimum, where the participation of black people in politics is even less. So uh, the numbers are awful in these regards. And then we have uh, this uh, city representative that is black, uh, lesbian, from the favela that defends uh, human rights. Uh, and she was elected uh, with uh, thousands and thousands of votes. Uh, so what's the message then to the elites with uh, a body of uh, this kind is elected? And not only that is elected, but it uses the mandate uh, to confront uh, the state violence, uh, to report the violence against the people that live in the, the favelas, uh, to denounce uh, feminicide, uh, to report uh, the dismantling of human rights. Uh, so that's a threat. But when that bond is a voice that reports all that, uh, that uh, body, in fact, puts at stake all that structure. So the political violence that we suffer is an attempt to silence this uh, fight against uh, the violence of a state, the violence against these bodies. There is no way to not to connect uh, the state violence with uh, other violences against the population. So when the, you imprisoned a black person without having any grounds, that's also a political violence. So there is no way to disconnect them. You know that we are undergoing a very tragic moment. It's very difficult to have hope in such a difficult moment in the world and in Brazil with some extreme gap between the rich people and the poor people. So what can we do? I am a congresswoman, but uh, I don't think that it is just through my mandate I can solve all the problems in Brazil. I like to think about the examples of the maroon communities. Um, so we had a, one of the biggest maroons communities called Quilombos here that was called Palmares. And uh, what are the characteristics of these communities? Uh, they have a collaborative process of decision making. They, I, am, I think that I am a communist, uh, so I, I consider myself a communist. Uh, and in fact, to me, the Maroon communities, the Quilombos as our true communist experience in Brazil. So we have uh, to look at them as uh, our horizon to direct us uh, and to help us, inspire us to organize the resistance. It's a resistance that will not come in hand of the institutions, uh, will come uh, from outside to within. It starts uh, with uh, the organization of uh, racial groups and other causes uh, about uh, the affirmative actions. I think that they are in jeopardy 
and um, we have the risk of not having them any longer. Uh, I, in terms of the quotas for black people, helped to correct a debt that was historical. If uh, you go, you used to go to a classroom in, in med school, for instance, you would never find a black person there. So then if I have uh, black people at the university, then uh, uh, in the future, they will get uh, to positions of power. And that was an important conquest, but at present, not only the affirmative action policies are in jeopardy, but when we dismantle, for instance, uh, the public education, uh, and uh, you can't uh, the funds for health and for education the, that serve the black population, you really put a lot of barriers and uh, make uh, for black people to be difficult to even complete uh, elementary school. So we are living a dismantling of all the structures that protect uh, black people and poorer people. And uh, about the lessons learned, uh, I think that, that we have a lot of differences, but also a lot of uh, similarities between the United States and Brazil. In terms of similarities, I think that our democracy, that our institutions, in our case, I think that we still have important fractures in our institutional organizations and uh, we are siblings and brothers uh, in the, the black movement. We need uh, to strengthen the, our the effort uh, in the anti-racist field because uh, all the, then the consequence uh, of not having Trump in power in a way is the result of all this black movement somehow and uh, we have also to consider how fragile the, this institutional logic is i don't know if the consequences of this uh, are gonna be similar here in brazil as the things uh, that uh, we have seen uh, in the united states uh, here we have the militia and the army dominating areas in Rio de Janeiro. We have necro politics that are really strong. We have a hate siege portrayed by organized groups. So under this colonial mindset, we still have to face a lot of challenges. I'm still hopeful, but uh, uh, I don't think that we can um, see so many similarities now in this moment, uh, what, what we are living in the States at present. So no lessons for how to beat Bolsonaro in 2022? Olha, eu acho que, sem dúvida, temos, temos lições. E a, a principal lição talvez seja que a derrota... Look, I'm sure we have lessons. Maybe the biggest lesson is that Bolsonaro will be defeated because of social mobilization where we have anti-racist movements. I am sure of that. And I know that anti-racist movements in the U.S., opened doors to a larger resistance with other groups and other political majorities. This created for an environment, a scenario where it was possible to defeat Trump. That's what I imagine. 
because of course this is not my country, the US, but I think the anti-racist movement was a trigger to resist the right. So I think that's one lesson. Now, I don't think we can say, well, we're going to have a broader alliance with right wing sectors that are liberal to fight Bolsonaro. Because I think the liberal right in Brazil has been a foundational pillar for Bolsonaro recently. So maybe that's the analogy that doesn't work. Because we are talking about a very conservative, very aristocratic right here. I do hope I can make myself clear because this right is not really interested in democratic freedoms. So to be very practical, I don't think this kind of alliance is possible. Maybe it won't be able to fight Bolsonaro here. I'm thinking out loud here, even though you are recording me, I'm trying to process this as we go. So maybe this is why this would be hard here and it's not possible to compare Brazil and the US. But I do think anti-racism movements are going to help us defeat Bolsonaro because this is something I will say, it is impossible to defeat Bolsonaro without the anti-racist struggle. Great. I have been told that I need to um, end the event at uh, five o'clock Boston time. And that is now, um, first of all, I apologize to those uh, questions that I was, we were unable to get. Uh, second of all, I want to give a, a heartfelt thanks to Congresswoman Petrone for her uh, terrific talk, but also really frank and insightful answers to uh, a variety of questions. I know uh, I, for one, learned a tremendous amount and was given much, much to think about. Finally, I want to um, offer a, an invitation to you. Uh, once this damn pandemic is over, uh, I hope that we can bring you to, to Harvard to, to speak and to, to continue this debate. Um, I don't think we're really able to give you much of a collective applause, but you've certainly earned one. So uh, on behalf of Dr. Class and the entire community of Harvard, <laughs> many, many thanks for taking the time and uh, sharing your ideas with us. Thank you.